Good morning, everybody. I'm Stora Mushri, Conservation Education Manager with the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. And for today's recording, we're going to have our deer program manager, Oren DeVouvier. He's going to be giving a presentation on net gunning. So with that, I'm going to let Oren take it away. Good morning, everybody. As Storm said, my name is Oren DeVubier. I've been the deer program manager with New Mexico Department of Game and Fish for just over five years now. I uh, grew up back east and moved out west after undergrad and um, worked in Colorado and Utah, Washington for a handful of years before coming to New Mexico. And I think we've landed where we're going to be and uh, have enjoyed our, our five years here. Um, as Storm said, I'll give a presentation on net gunning. Um, so I put this uh, presentation together with our captain of field operations, Ty Jackson. And you can see in the, the opening screen here a picture of, of just what net gunning is. It's, it's capturing animals from a helicopter using a net gun. So what is net gunning and why do we need it? Net gunning is a method to capture animals for various wildlife management or research needs. We might want to know the survivorship of the animals, um, where they're moving to, where they're migrating to. Uh, we might have some other research needs that we, we want to answer questions about. So we got to figure out a way to capture these animals. And especially in this mountainous terrain um, that we live in and that we work in, capture isn't always easy. So uh, it's not always easy from the vehicles or, or from traditional methods. So uh, net gunning is resorted to, to to catch these animals. So net gunning is the act of actually shooting a net over an animal, just exactly what it sounds like. Uh, most net gunning is aerial, like I like the opening screen showed. It's um, from mostly from a helicopter, but it also can be from the ground in certain situations. So when we have aerial net gunning. Um, there's usually a gunner and a mugger and the gunner is the, the person who shoots the net. And then the mugger is the person who gets out and physically restrains the animal in ground net gunning situations. We don't always need both people. It's a, it's a little quicker. Um, and it's usually for smaller animals such as turkeys and, and things of that nature, maybe some avian species. So net gunning can be used for a, a range of species, um, a variety of species ranging from bison or moose to even eagles, uh, sage grouse, and, and really everything in between. Um, some, some images here are animals that are, are commonly net gunned. In New Mexico, we mostly use net guns for ungulates, which are hooved animals such as deer, pronghorn, elk, and bighorn sheep. That's, the, that's what we mostly use net guns for. In other states and, and maybe in other situations or applications, net guns are used to capture sage grouse on the say bottom left, golden and bald eagles in the um, bottom left of the screen again. Moose in other states, coyotes are commonly net gunned and wolves are, are commonly net gunned in certain areas and situations. So why do we net gun? Well, it's a, as I mentioned earlier, a capture tool for research or management purposes. We want to potentially get collars out on animals for, um, again, to monitor, monitor their movements, monitor their survival, maybe how they interact in certain situations and settings with each other, maybe how um, they interact in maybe urban settings with, with uh, various folks and, and uh, urban situations. So as I mentioned initially, again, um, net gunning is used to capture animals in areas that we can't otherwise access. You know, we might not always be able to get uh, a drop net or other means of captures in some of these mountainous terrains, maybe uh, bighorn sheep in the case of this middle picture with the helicopter um, are in very rugged country that you can't set up traps you can't get to on foot. And so we need to access it by a helicopter and, and net gun them. Um, net gunning is very useful for targeting specific animals based on their age or their sex or maybe other attributes. Maybe there's a specific animal who's 
collar had died and we want to replace the collar. Maybe there's an injury or, or something of that nature. So it's, it's very good at targeting specific animals based on the attribute that you want to study. So first and foremost with net gunning is human safety. That's, that's the number one thing that we talk about and that we want to, to stress. Um, in all situations, firearm awareness is key and crucial. It's just like your hunter education course or, or just like anything involving a, a firearm or a weapon. You, you never point the net gun anywhere that you aren't intending to shoot, whether it's loaded or not. Um, you're always aware of what direction that's pointing. And it's, it's even more, um, it's even more obvious when you're, when you're in a helicopter and it's a tense situation, a lot of things are happening at once. A lot of things are, are moving and going on. Um, always keeping that net gun pointed out the window, whether it's loaded or not out the door, whether it's loaded or not, uh, is crucial. The, the weights themselves at the end of the net can actually um, badly injure or kill people or animals. Um, and then also if, if you accidentally fire the net up in the air into the rotor blades, that'll take down the whole helicopter and um, badly injure or kill the crew. So just always knowing where that net gun is pointed is, is crucial. And then after that, uh, there's a, a range of safety equipment that need to be worn by the crews. Um, always wear a helmet when you're in the helicopter. And then uh, the mugger should always be seat belted in the front seat. And then the gunner, as you can see in the bottom left picture, has to hang a little bit out of the helicopter. And so they should always be wearing a harness. They, the harness connects to um, some restraints within the helicopter that allows you to lean out and get the, the angle that you need on the shot without falling out and, and keeps you safe. So that's um, crucial safety equipment in this operation, these types of operations. You can see um, the top right picture. Um, that was my helmet that an elk rolled over. Uh, you can see just, just even, I wasn't in the helicopter at the time, but the elk rolled over it and you can see the type of damage that the elk itself did. So even when you're not in the helicopter and working up animals, um, having a helmet on is, is crucial for your safety. And then the safety equipment, after the safety equipment, um, helicopter awareness is very vital, not only for the, the crew itself, but for the processing crews on the ground and anybody working around the helicopter, knowing where the danger areas are with the helicopter, knowing where you can and cannot walk uh, is very crucial. You can see in the, the bottom picture here, the processing crew, the bottom middle, the processing crew is waiting for the helicopter to get in a safe spot before they go out and retrieve the deer that are being slung in beneath the helicopter. And then on top of that, the crew in the helicopter are always watching where the rotor blades are gone and the, uh, the main rotor and the tail rotor blades are gone. You can see in the bottom right, all three passengers are looking out to clear the vegetation on the ground to make sure that there aren't going to be any rotor strikes with vegetation or rocks and things of that nature. So first and foremost is, is human safety um, and, and, and communication and helicopter awareness. So I mentioned communication. It's key. Uh, the ground crew must be in contact with the helicopter to know where it's going to be landing and where they can and cannot stand. But in the helicopter, the crew, all three folks are always talking with each other. Am I clear here? Uh, is the rotor clear? Is the shot open? Can the mugger get out at this point? Can the uh, gunner get out at this point? Um, everybody must be on the same page. The gunner shouldn't take a shot unless the pilot is ready for them to take the shot because that, that's where things can, can go haywire. Um, the gunner might shoot when the helicopter, when the pilot isn't expecting and, uh, the helicopter is turning and might shoot into one of the rotor blades or, or into some danger one way or another. So making sure everybody's on the same page is crucial. And then once you get the animal down, um, 
uh, for human safety, animal handling experience is also vital. Um, there are hobbles to restrain the legs so you don't get kicked. There are proper holds that, that you must learn so that way uh, your partner doesn't get kicked or hurt. And then um, some blindfolds on the animals to kind, kind of calm them down. With this, you were talking about wildlife captures, but we found that some of the best wildlife handlers are individuals who have livestock handling experience. Um, in fact, we, we've gone to some different ranches to help brand. You can see on the bottom left, we've gone to some different ranches to help with their cattle work. So that way we can learn uh, proper holds better and things of that nature. So that way, not only are we safe, but if the animals are safe. You can see in the bottom right, I didn't know the proper holds at the time and the, the danger areas and I got kicked and, and got a few stitches. Um, so again, animal handling experience and, and knowing where the danger areas are is, is crucial. In the middle, these are three uh, folks who have a lot of livestock handling experience and they're working up an elk, um, rolling it over, but they're aware of where they can and can't stand and working together to get that elk restrained so they can put a collar on it. So then after that, I, I mentioned, after human safety, I mentioned wildlife safety. So after we're taking care of ourselves, then we, we think about the animal um, and the various considerations for it, how we can get a net on it safely. So when we're thinking of this, we think of how fast is the animal running what direction is he running? Um, what's the terrain like in front of the animal? If we get a net over the animal and it runs a little bit, is it going to potentially fall off of a rock, go into a gully and, and hurt itself in the gully? Um, and then we also try to consider the snowpack and snow cover. It's much safer for the animal if we net it in snow because it gives it a bit of a cushion and gives it some uh, a bit of some time to slide uh, and not be on rocks or hard ground and things of that nature. Um, when all those are taken into consideration, we also think about chase time. How long is it going to take to get that animal to a safe area that we can net it? Um, we, to back up a little bit, we try to net an animal. If it's going slightly uphill, we never put a net on an animal when it's going downhill because that's when they're going the fastest and they can roll and hurt themselves. So how long does it take to get them to that spot? And we watch the clock once we start the initial chase on the animal. We limit, for most species, we limit our chase time to six minutes, which um, it's not a whole lot of time, um, but when you're, you're in the helicopter and chasing, it actually can seem like a, a bit longer than what it really feels in real life. Um, so how can we get it to an area that we can safely net it within that six minutes time within that chase time? We're also looking at the animal for signs of stress and fatigue. Is its tongue hanging out? Is it frothing at the mouth? Um, is it, is it oh, panting too hard? And if we start seeing signs of, of stress or fatigue, we'll, we'll back off. Maybe if we need that specific animal, maybe come back several hours later or if that's, we don't need that specific one, we'll go ahead and find another target animal. So once we get the net on them, we blindfold them, covering their eyes, calms them down really quickly. Um, and then we'll hobble them as soon as possible. And then if we're not slinging them back to a processing station, we'll process them on site and release them as quickly as possible. So when you're, you're net gunning, you want to think about the net, you want to think about what species you're targeting. Uh, that's going to dictate what net you choose. And then it's also going to dictate the proper charge. So uh, on the bottom left, we're net gunning an elk and we have a larger net. It not only has um, a larger perimeter or diameter of the net, but it has larger squares and mesh within the net. So that, that larger mesh is so that way the animal's neck or the elk's neck isn't um, stuck in the net. It can get out, get through the mesh, and it's not cutting off some oxygen or blood flow. 
the larger diameter of the net is so that way the whole net can get around the elk and doesn't just get bound up, say, over the head and not actually catch the leg. You want that net to get under the legs of the animal and trip it up and help restrain it. So if you use too small of diameter net or too small of mesh size, mesh size that, won't, that won't get over the elk enough to restrain it. In the bottom right, you can see we're, we're netting a bighorn sheep. We use a smaller net with smaller mesh for deer sized animals. We would never use a deer net on an elk. That would, as I mentioned, just bind up on the head, not get the legs and, and not trip it up. And that elk will potentially run forever with that net around it. And then several days later, it may get hung up somewhere and not be able to, to get out. So we always make sure we're using the proper net for the animal that we're targeting. And then the net that you use dictates what charge you use. So there are some charges that are loaded a little bit lighter and they won't shoot. The lighter charges won't shoot the elk net and you won't get the proper spread or distance to capture that elk. And then vice versa, if you use the charge that's meant for the elk net on the deer net, that that net will shoot too far over too quickly. You Again, you won't get the proper spread and you'll miss the animal altogether. So um, just matching up the net size for the animal and then match, matching up the charge for the net size is important. So once you've chosen what net you're going to use for the animal that you're targeting, you'll then need to make sure your net is packed correctly. Um, it involves untangling the nets. Uh, this happens in the field after every shot, uh, either the, the net crew itself and the gunning crew themselves or a ground crew untangles the nets. Oftentimes it's, it's hung up with a lot of sticks and debris that you need to get out. And it's a bit of a puzzle to untangle them and takes, takes some time. But once you untangle them and spread them out, then you inspect the nets and the weights themselves for inspect the nets for ripped rope or, or holes in the net holes within the mesh. And you inspect the weights for, uh, scuffs and burrs and to make sure that the gaskets are, are fit on the weights properly. And then once they're spread out and inspected, you can pack a net by yourself. It's a bit harder. You just have to pay a little bit more attention to the details, but it's a little easier if you have a partner and you each grab a corner of the net and you uh, walk it to each other and have one person hold all four weights and keep the weights in their appropriate positions. And then another the second individual takes the net and loads it into one of these orange canisters that you see, uh, loads it from the middle and, and packs it down in. And again, once you get to the weights, once it's all packed in and you get to the weights, keeping the weights in the appropriate position, you put them in the appropriate corners, the front right weight in the front right corner, front left weight in the front left, back right and back left appropriately. And that's to make sure that the nets aren't crossed and that you get a, a good shot on the uh, next shot that you shoot with that net. And once it's loaded into the canister, then you take some masking tape and you tape it down to keep the net within the canister. Um, you can see there's a link that I've included for one of the net gun manufacturers on how to properly, properly load a net with two people. It's about a two or three minute video that you can watch and see what I'm talking about a little more clearly. So packing the net is important for safety first and foremost of the capture crew um, to make sure that the net deploys properly, that make sure the net is properly ejected away from the helicopter. And then after the safety aspect it, it packing a net properly make sure that you don't get a cross net a cross net i've never seen a cross net catch an animal i've heard that it, it can but it typically what it does is it'll cross and it'll not get within the legs or over the head of the animal and they won't get tangled up and it just slides off the animal and and then you have to take another shot um so it it it's more effective at catching the animal when the nets are not crossed and you're not wasting a shot, you're not wasting time. And then that also, um, if you miss a shot and 
because of a cross net and then you have to take another shot that's increasing the animal stress and the chase time on that animal. So it's just important for, um, for properly and, and quickly catching the animal to not have cross nets. It's not super detailed or involved. You just have to pay attention to what you're doing when you're packing them. And I have a video here of a cross net or a stuck net. Um, it, it got taped down on one of those eye bolts that you see in the bottom left corner. Uh, there's a, an eye bolt on that black strap. It got taped onto that. And so when I took the shot, the net just hung up and it actually was, was kind of dangerous or pretty dangerous to the crew because um, the net was hanging out of the helicopter and going back toward the tail rotor and had to grab it pretty quickly. So in this video, you can see we're chasing a deer um, and we we're getting ready to, to net it. And it's actually a really neat video because you can see how the helicopter works from outside of the helicopter. You can see he has to come in sideways and, and roll over top of the animal for us to get the shot. Um, but on this particular video, we are working a deer and getting ready to take a shot. And when I get in a, we get in the proper position, I shoot. And that's where the net hangs up. And you can see at the very end when the helicopter gets back on the skyline, you can see the net hanging down. So right there, you can see the nets hanging below the helicopter and, and, and flaring back toward that tail rotor. And I had to grab it and pull it in pretty quick. Uh, it didn't fall off. It was, I was able to, to get it before it came off the canister, but it still was a pretty uh, dicey situation for a couple of seconds. Then when you actually are shooting at an animal with the net gun, as I mentioned earlier, always firearm awareness, always talking to the pilot. Um, and the pilot and I are always in communication. Okay, I'm coming out of the helicopter. I'm putting the cartridge in. The bolt is down, we're live. We say that every single time we get ready to net. So that way the pilot knows where I'm at. That way I know where the pilot's at. We're on the same page. We'll even be talking, okay, I'll, we're going to target this back animal on the left. Okay, get ready. It's almost in the spot. Okay, when you're ready, shoot. And so that's, it's just constant communication the whole time. And it, it ends up just becoming second nature. You're not, you're not, actively thinking about it except for when you're putting the cartridge in you're saying those so that way you know what you're doing the pilot knows what they're doing and it is a it is an active you're 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 thinking about every step of the way so you don't absent-mindedly shoot the net somewhere it's kind of like your your pre-shot routine when you're getting ready to shoot a bow at an at a target or an animal or a firearm at a target or animal so then when you're, when you're firing the net at an animal, you're accounting for the speed of the animal, the speed of the helicopter, always talking with the pilot about wind direction. Do we have a crosswind or a headwind? Because that dictates your lead time or lag time on the, on the shot. It dictates if you're going to shoot, if you have a crosswind coming from left to right, you're actually going to shoot to the left of the animal with the anticipation that the wind's going to blow it into the animal. Uh, you're, as I mentioned at the beginning, you're looking at the terrain, you're making sure if you have an uphill shot that you're not actually shooting up into the rotor blades. And then um, thinking about the direction, is the, is the helicopter rotating to where you need to lead it based on the helicopter's rotation around the animal? Or is the animal going to gonna jump to the right or running to the right? And so that all all dictates how you take that shot and where you're, where you're pointing that net gun. Then on top of that, you have to time the shot. So it gets the net over the animal in an opening. If there's any sort of vegetation that can hang it up, uh, any sort of sticks or a branch, um, maybe some sagebrush that doesn't fully get over the animal, they'll be able to spin out and get away. And again, that wastes the shot, wastes time and increases stress on the animal. Um, so you're just always trying to time the shot to get in the open. You can see on the, the bottom left, it's, it's very open grasslands. You don't really need to time it for vegetation. You just need to make sure that you're on the same page with the pilot and account for those other variables that I mentioned earlier. 
But on the bottom right, you can see we're netting an elk in some juniper country and we shoot the net as it crosses uh, a road and is getting ready to get into some snow. So that way it has a safe cushion for landing, but also there's no vegetation to hang the net up. So then once you account for all those variables and the, the timing of the shot, um, then that's when the, the mugger gets out. The helicopter safely lands and the mugger gets out to physically restrain the animal. And again, the whole time communication is key. When uh, we're coming in to land, we might not have a clear landing and the pilot will need to set down, uh, just put maybe one skid on, a, on an area or maybe we'll have to... Um, get out and get out away from the helicopter and, and run a certain direction. So that way we avoid the rotor blades and, and things of that nature, or just kneel down right by the helicopter before it takes off. So that way uh, you're safe before it, it goes away. Um, so communication the entire time after the shot, communication through the shot. And then after the shot, the pilot said, okay, I'm going to find a spot to land over here. Okay, mugger, you're going to get out just crouch down right here and I'll take off or mugger get out and go to the left. And that's when the mugger uh, follows the pilot's instructions and gets out and, and physically goes to restrain the animal. So I'll show a couple of videos here of uh, what we're talking about, what the whole process is for this net gunning and mugging and, and collaring of these animals. So this is a capture that we did in the Vias Caldera on elk. You can see this is a GoPro that was attached to the gun. And that gun itself, you, once you get over the animal and in a, animal in a good spot, you can shoot the net over it. Um, net's deployed and then the mugger gets out. These are just several captures of, of actually netting at once. And then uh, here in a minute or two, you'll see videos of the mugger getting out to to restrain the animal and, and catch it. There's Ty Jackson in the front. He's the mugger on this project. There he's getting out. Pilot says, okay, you can get out and go get it. And here, this one actually was a calm one and he was able to, to physically restrain it, give a thumbs up to the pilot. We're, we're good to go, time to collar it. This is our chief of wildlife when he was gunning and he, he's putting the collar on it and then they're gonna, gonna let it go. Here you can see they're, they're net gunning in some trees. Uh, do we have an open shot? No, probably not yet. Let's get them in the open. Okay, they got the, the elk in the open and getting a net on it. There you can see Stuart with the harness to keep him into the, in the helicopter and keep him safe. There's a, a perfect net for that animal. So here you can see some, some junipers that we're having to work the elk in between. We get them in the open, coming in for the shot. And the whole time we're talking, the pilot, this pilot's Earl, he's saying, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna get this back one in the, it's in the shadow of the helicopter right now. We're gonna, we're gonna chase this one and try to catch it. And this is a perfect scenario with the snow Great net by James. He was our gunner on this one. And you can see kind of in the bottom right how the, the elk slides and, and uh, has a, a relatively soft landing. And then from here, Earl's talking, okay, we're going to set down over here. I'm going to let you out, Oren. I was a little slow getting out on this one. I wasn't quite ready to, to get out at, the, at that time. Just didn't have myself prepared. I wanted to be a little bit quicker. Um, but you can see me jumping out as the mugger and then I'll restrain it. And then James is coming quickly to, to help further restrain it and get it down. As the mugger, the best thing to do is to, to get on that neck and head so the animal can't get up. And there, James restrains it. We have a blindfold on it and some hobbles. And then we get to take our measurements and, and collar it and and get everything all squared away to release that animal. So I appreciate everybody tuning in to listen to this presentation on net gunning. Um, if you're considering a career in wildlife management, this is a fantastic career and a, a great agency to work for. And uh, ever since I selected this career path, I, I've been 
been happy ever since and haven't looked back. So thanks again for tuning in and uh, feel free to reach out to us with any questions. I want to thank you today um, for your time, Warren. I know that you all are extremely busy year round and it's one of those that it's always a joy to work with you. I've got to work with you on multiple projects. You're always the the professional, um, making sure that everyone and the animals are always safe. And, uh, you know, I can't wait to get back out there with you again. And before I let you go today, Oren, I, I've got one question I'd like to ask you, but, um, you know, I'm assuming that probably when you were, you know, at a younger age, I don't know when you decided that, Hey, I would like to be a wildlife biologist and just being able to share a, a small piece of what you get to do, with your job today was pretty cool. But the, the question that I have for you is if you can think back, uh, you know, possibly mid school transitioning into high school or even your high school years, if there were some classes that you took that really helped you um, as you got into college to get that degree in hand. And if you wouldn't mind just kind of reminding us, you know, what, what degree do you have Oren? So. Sure. Yeah. My, I, so I have a, undergrad or a bachelor's degree in wildlife sciences from Ohio State and I have a master's of science or master's in wildlife management from Utah State University uh, to help my career and to help get into that those college programs. I would say the most beneficial courses for me in middle school and high school were my science and biology courses and then I'm a little bit of a, a math nerd. I really enjoy numbers and math. And I think even if you're not a math nerd, math is an important um, subject and important topic for folks going into this field. So any, any advanced or just any science and, and biology type courses in general will help you as you go into this program in, in college. And then any math programs that you can get into, if, you, if you're interested in math and can do some advanced maths, I think that really helped me as well. It helped once I got into, into this field, not only in my um, college courses and graduate courses, but even afterwards, my, my math has helped me. I don't, I don't think everybody has to take advanced math, but if you can and are able to, I, I think it's an important thing. This, as, as you mentioned, Storm, is a, a small part of my job. A lot of it involves being around uh, the computer, looking at the data that we collected and analyzing it um, and, and figuring out what, what this is actually telling us, what this information is telling us. And then um, any sort of communications courses you can take is, is crucial as well. We, we do wildlife management but everybody always says, and it's 100% true, that it's, it's people management as well. I'm on the phone and, and all the biologists that I know, all the officers, we're always talking to people daily. Uh, hey, what are you finding? What are these animals doing in this area? And even just, hey, where's the best place to go hunting? And just communications courses to either convey that information verbally or written uh, through email or, or formal documents is, is imperative. And I think, I think biology, to answer your question again, biology courses, math courses, and communication courses um, will greatly benefit anybody looking to go into this field. All righty. Thank you, Oren. And again, I appreciate your time today. And I know everyone's going to enjoy this, this module, this video that we just did. And with that, um, we'll see you at the next one. So thank you.